Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the CBCA Queensland branch judges talk on older reader, younger reader, and e panel awards. I'd like to introduce to you Trish Buckley as our MC for the night. Hello. I begin tonight by acknowledging the tradition owners of the land on which we gather, the Yagara and Turbul peoples, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend this welcome to all the lands wherever you are listening and watching from. Thank you for responding to our very late call tonight. Um, we did this in planning day and then we decided at the last minute or not we just left it and you have all just been so amazing to come in and listen to these judges and we really appreciate your support. Um, tonight we will hear from three judges. The older reader judge is Michael Earp, the Eve Pownell judge is Cheryl Coote and the younger reader judge is Danielle Miller. We are trying to be very strict with them and we're asking them to really be firm with their timelines to keep it under 20 minutes per um, category to get you out at a nice, reasonable time. But of course, these people are very passionate about these books, so we're just going to be nice to them. Um, but you will have an opportunity to ask questions, so please add them to the chat. And after their uh, initial talk about each book, we'll have some time at the end to respond to questions. So we will be trying to address them then. So if you think of something in the middle of the talk, just add it to the chat. Um, Jenny is going to now show us the slide that lets you see the number of books submitted into each category. So you can see the, the numbers there. Um, and these are quite healthy numbers, which is excellent to see the, the production of books in Australian children and young adult literature. I'm going to let each judge say a few words about themselves. So I'd like to now please welcome the older reader, Judge Michael Earp. Classic Michael, not unmuting. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Michael Earp. I'm a bookseller at the Little Book Room in Melbourne. I've been a children's specialist bookseller for close to 20 years now. Uh, I have an undergraduate in early childhood teaching and I did my master's in children's literature. So I've pretty much dedicated my entire adult life to children's books and I love it and it's all I ever want to talk about. Um, so it was very handy being a judge because that's all you do talk about children's books and good ones. Um, so I'll talk about the short list tonight. I um, was looking over my notes to like refresh my memory and realized that each book's description started with a really well written blah blah and I'm like well of course, naturally, they all have all made the shortlist. So I'll try and like trim the individual books by not saying that they're all really well written because let's just take it as given. Um, the first book uh, that I'll talk about is Girls in Boys' Cars um, by Felicity uh, Cast Castagna. Um, this is a fantastic story uh, set in Sydney's Western suburbs of a girl who just finds herself pushed to the brink um, with uh, the way she's being treated by the, the patriarchal culture and the boys in her life. And so it gets to a point where she basically <laughs> steals her boyfriend's car and she and her best friend go on a joyride into the country um, to uh, express all of that ang pent up anger. It's really interesting in the way it unfolds because it's not a linear narrative. Uh, you get, uh, it, um, it opens with her telling the story in journal format from prison. And then she uh, flash, like she tells the flashbacks and gradually the storylines converge. Um, there's so much to this book uh, that I just think is, is brilliant. But one of the things that really grabbed me is the way that halfway through their joyride in the country, um, they find themselves in the middle of the 2019-2020 uh, bushfires and suddenly uh, 
like life comes back into focus for them. And I, but it, the way it positioned you as the reader, having gone through that, um, maybe not quite to the extent that they do, but uh, it certainly um, was really uh, captivating reading that kind of take on those devastating bushfires. Uh, yeah, I think I'll stop there with that one, otherwise I'll go on forever. Um, next one is How to Repaint a Life from Stephen Herrick. Um, I hope you've read some Stephen Herrick in the past because he's just so good. This one um, really explores themes of homelessness and uh, again, um, the patriarchy and uh, bullying and all sorts of things, but it's really hopeful in the way that it approaches them. Like there's really heavy topics and the tension in it is brilliant, but it also doesn't um, leave you feeling devastated at any point and nor do you pity the characters too much like it's it's really a um honest but positive look at the way lives can turn out when someone has to leave their house because of domestic violence and living rough is not necessarily the end of the world despite its hardships um, I also think the way that this story talks about consent and um, sexual relationships is beautiful and really timely um, and also shows a gorgeous um, daughter-parent relationship, uh, parents. Um, it alternates between two characters and the girl's parents and her, their relationship is just something to aspire to as far as I'm concerned. So um, again, that's really well contrasted against the boy character who has had to leave home because of his abusive father. Um, yeah, it's just, it's really heartfelt and um, beautifully written. Um, the next one is also um, a bit devastating in some ways. It, it really uh, grips you in its immediacy and um, the contemporary sort of, you really set, you feel that it's set now. Um, this follows a girl who um, is in uh, year seven or eight, sorry, I've forgotten, um, but uh, she's, a first generation um, Chinese immigrant and the the way her the gender roles are traditionally assigned in her family are overbearing and uh, really containing for both her and her mother and so the um, catalyst of this story is when um, a boy from her school, his mother commits suicide and she just wants to look after him and make sure he's okay. But her father says that because she did that, she has brought shame on their family and um, went not to associate due to that shame by association. And so it's all about um, both the main character and her mother gradually finding their voice and standing up to do the right thing and show compassion in the face of their own, um, uh, like, oh, brain just shut down, um, uh, family situation. Um, very, very powerful, that one. Um, the next title is... I think the boy from the Mish. Um, yes, this one is absolutely gorgeous, really love filled and again, heartwarming. Um, it is the first time that uh, gay male characters 
uh, that are Indigenous have been written let, in Australia, let alone by an Indigenous author. So I'm personally really excited about this book and what it offers to um, just Australian publishing in general. But on top of that, again, it's, it's a beautiful story. It really explores consent in lovely ways and um, the way that uh, culture is uh, culture and land is such an important part of um, contemporary Indigenous Australians' lives. So the main character of this is living on a mission and then a boy um, who has had trouble um, in his life comes to stay with them um, after getting out of uh, juvenile detention and um, their friendship and then romance that blossoms from that connection um, is just really lovely. And one of the things that um, helps him sort of come around from his, I don't know, wayward ways is seeing um, the main character's connection to land and country and culture and going to um, men's business ceremonies and it's yeah I just I'm very enthusiastic about this one um, and yes as someone said in the chat it has a beautiful cover um, the where are we fifth title uh, is Tercial and Eleanor I'm sure you've heard of Garth Nix and uh, his Old Kingdom series, uh, the first of which was uh, Sabriel, um, published uh, quite some time ago. Um, this is a prequel to Sabriel. It tells the story of how Sabriel's parents came to meet. Um, I have not read any of the others in this series. I've read other Garth Nix, but none from the Old Kingdom. And so I went in with a very critical eye on could this be picked up by someone who does not know these books? And I have to say that I was completely swept up in this story. And even knowing that this is um, how the main character of the rest of the series parents meet, you never felt like that was a sure thing throughout the entire book. Like both of these characters have their own narratives, their own trajectories, and then it just coincides like, coincidentally leads them together and then at the end you realize oh and this is um leads into the um sabriel so it absolutely works for someone who has not read the rest of the series um i now plan on going and reading the rest of the series because i just thought it was so well done beautifully just um descriptive language and it's a good um entry point for people who are not necessarily big on fantasy either because it pits the old kingdom against the southern kingdom where they don't believe in magic and there's lots of literary pun references that make it feel more like a historical our world setting even though it is still fantasy and so that it I feel like it it's a way in for readers who might otherwise have not picked up high fantasy. And the last one on the short list is uh, Sugartown Queens, which again, just really blew me away with how uh, engaging and uh, just how much I connected with it. It's set in South Africa and um, in a sort of shanty town um, outside a wealthy city. And so you, the, there are lots of contrasts between the haves and the have nots, um, the wealthy and the poor, and also the racism uh, to do with skin tone because um, the main character is, um, uh, has, Mix, is mixed race and so is not accepted in the wealthy white city areas but then is also too pale to be seen as part of the uh, part of the community um, in the shanty town too and when she discovers that her mother 
um, so her, her grandmother is ill and um, wants to start reading, read, uh, sorry, um, wants to start visiting her in hospital. Um, that creates um, conflict with her grandfather who is quite blatantly a racist and does not want her as part of the family. Um, but on top of that, I just thought like, there were so many themes in it and situations that would be so relatable to teenagers in Australian school settings, the friendship dramas, the relationship dramas, um, the way they all relate to each other. Um, it's, it's both an insight to another way of life, as well as a reflection of what we go through here in our own society. And that's, uh, that's, the short list. Um, I think we'll be doing questions and things at the end. Um, I've seen a few pop up that I will absolutely stick around and answer those for you then. Fish? I'm just yeah. unmuting. Bear with me. My chat was right over the mute button and I was <laughs> trying to use the mouse from my other computer. Shush. Thank you very much, Michael. That was excellent. Very concise and very succinct. So good to see. There's actually only been one question so far. So come on, people, get your questions in. Did you have to read or did you read all 62 entries, Michael? Um, yeah, that was, that was what we have to do. And we have to write a little report on all 62 entries as well. It uh, And when... 35 of them came in on the 22nd of December. It was uh, quite a task. It doesn't seem to be whatever we try to do to get publishers to send the books in earlier. It's, it's, it's been going on for the years that Tehani and I have been judging, even back then, or way back then. Um, still had trouble getting them in on time. So, yeah, that December time is really awful. Mm -hmm. It, um, it wasn't the most of fun, but uh, <laughs> well, I also don't understand why they do it because it doesn't serve their book. It the doesn't, thing. does it? No. Um, you, you just are not giving it the total time you could possibly have given it had you had more time. That's right. Um, do I have any questions? Come on, Tehani, you and I, we're chitty chatting here. Um, so how did the three judges get on? Was it a fairly um, conducive process for just the three of you working together? Um, yes and no. Mm -hmm. uh, we, um, there were some disagreements and um, lively discussions, but that's the point of that's the judges' correct. process. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And, but like, when we came to the shortlist, um, I think we all, like, we all had at least five or so of what ended up on the shortlist. Okay. Each, each on our individual shortlist yep. anyway. So yep. it was a pretty um, easy process at that point. Um, there's one here from uh, somebody who says, which books of the shortlist are appropriate for the years nine, seven to nine? So the lower end. Can you tell right. us about I, those books? So um, of the ones on the shortlist, um, it, it might be easier to talk to the other way. Um, yep, yep. So basically... Uh, Girls in Boys Cars, How to Repaint a Life, Boy from the Mish, and to a small degree, Sugartown Sugar Queens, Queens. Yeah. do contain sex to an extent. Mm -hmm. Sugartown Queens, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, but outside of that, I mean, I have year seven to nine book clubbers that would absolutely at work that would absolutely devour every single one of these books mm -hmm. and I personally wouldn't have a problem with that but I know mm. it's a slightly different situation in a school setting mm. um Tercial and Eleanor and Tiger Daughter are absolutely fine in fact I sell Tiger Daughter into primary schools as yeah. well 
Um, and Tercial and Eleanor could go into primary schools too for those grade five, six readers that want a slightly meatier mm. fantasy read. Mm. Um, but then, as you say, they go like up to the high ends of high school as mm. well. Mm. Um, yeah, the, uh, those four that I mentioned, you might just want to uh, read them yourself before you know exactly which of your students to recommend them to. Mm. But overall... I would be happy for them to be in the library mm. personally, but I know each library approaches that kind of content a little bit differently. Thank you. Yes, that's clever. Um, somebody's asked if you could just recommend one title to an adult book club. So hard, Michael. Have a go at that. Oh, from this shortlist? Yes, yes. Um, I usually get my adult book club to read a shortlisted book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. Goodness, I, oh, just one. I mean, I could recommend four of them at least. Yes, no. <laughs> um, so Tercy and Eleanor, if, if they're fantasy prone, um, I think it's very much written in a way that adult readers will appreciate it too. Um, I think Boy from the Mish is very heartwarming and uplifting and gives a perspective that isn't often seen that's um, right and so I think that would also make for good adult discussion um or tiger daughter even though technically speaking this is the one that I'm also happy to sell to the youngest people um like I sell it into grade five six as well um the it just does what it's set out to do so cleanly that I think an adult group book club um, discussing it and all of the cultural implications as they are in everyday life. Um, I just, yeah, it's really, really good. And as someone just says, said, Girls and Boys Cars um, is also great for a nostalgia feel. It does have... Um, a great, uh, you can almost see yourself there as a teenager going through a lot of that. But again, you've asked this question of someone who doesn't read um, adult books and runs two book clubs for adults that read kids and YA. So uh, uh. Um, <laughs> I'm like every book, just yeah. read all the books. Yeah. Um, and I, ha I don't get on board with adults that look down on mm. children's or YA mm. as being less than. Um, I have no time for them. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we read um, Girls in Boys Cars at our, our secondary teacher librarian network. So we were all teacher librarians. And it, it, pro it provided a very good discussion. You know, we, we had lots to talk about with that one. I could Yes, yeah, there's lots to unpack. Mm. A, a very particular viewpoint that we just have not seen before, that it it's really needs to be read, I think, too. So, yes, you're right, it's, it's impossible. So have fun with that, Carmel. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, we're going to push along. I'm looking at my little um, judges talk run sheet and not, 628, Michael. You oh, we're doing well. Doing so well. Okay, so thank you very much. And I'm going to pass it on to Cheryl now. And Cheryl is going to talk to us about the Eve Panel Information Book shortlist. So welcome, Cheryl, and thank you very much for being here. Hi, thanks. I did remember to unmute it. Um, <laughs> so thanks for the opportunity to talk about these shortlisted books. Um, as you know, Eve Panel is factual material. So nonfiction, biography, autobiography can be in so many different formats, picture books, graphic novels, conventional uh, formats, and also more creative design and layout. And it's got an age range of 0 to 18 years, which makes it a particularly challenging but exciting category because it not only has that wide age range like picture books do, but it has such a diversity of format and subject matter. Now, as you know, we've got a set of criteria to judge it against from literary merit. Every book was fact-checked and with 72 entries and some of them 
even from the ones on the short list, are quite dense in the information contained. That's huge. Uh, so a judge against subject matter, setting, characterization, you know, writing, design, layout, format, and engagement. And we found that as judges in an age of such ready access to information through technology and the internet, we were conscious of that engagement factor so that a book of the year had to be so much more than an encyclopedic recitation of facts and you know, can, contain a lot more than a simple Google search would reveal. So each of these shortlisted books, I hope you'll agree, meets all the criteria to a high standard, standard and demonstrates creativity in the way it's presented or the information it's contained. So first book is, I'm, I'm going through them in alphabetical order, so I'm not showing, trying not to show any uh, preference to what the, the final uh, winner might be. So first book, Book of Curious Birds, written and illustrated by Jennifer Cossens. She, Jennifer's a Tasmanian artist and writer. She's previously been recognised by CBCA for A to Z of Endangered Animals, which was an honour book in 2017. And her Baby Animals book was a notable book in, sorry, 17 and Baby Animals in 18. So I think you'll see from reading the book, she has a passion for the animal kingdom and uh, particularly fanc fascinated with the curiosities of the birds in our world. She loves drawing birds and loves the ugly, the bizarrely beautiful, and did an incredible amount of research on this. So this book is a high quality information, picture and reference book. It's got life cycles, behaviors, and the conservation status of birds in a very appealing format. You'll find birds with peculiar beaks, beady eyes, and funny colored feet, birds with fascinating mating dances, funny hairdos, and remarkable hunting skills. Her introduction is very welcoming and provides a context for the information that follows. As she explains um, her fascination for the bird kingdom, her beautiful illustrations dominate each well-organized double page spread, which is maintained right throughout as a consistent format. So she does include basic facts, you know, the conventional height, weight, et cetera, but then it varies for each species where she looks at individual peculiarities, which of course reinforces that topic of curious birds. She uses very clear language. Each fact page has a, um, a subtitle, which is very visual and adds an alternative description for the reader. She incorporates a variety of fonts and colors used to present each section of the text, which helps with the rhythm and flow and dividing up the different types of information. And her illustrations are bright, colorful, detailed, highlighting the special features of each species. Her end papers are beautiful as she repeats the um, lion pink peacock drawings and her beautiful cover gives you an idea of what's to come. Like most, but not all um, books in this category, you know, your contents glossary, those standard useful references help you locate particular species because it's a book you kind of dip in and out of. And she does use the International Union for Conservation of Nature as her uh, reference regarding conservation. So in her words, this is a book for bird lovers. If you are not one already, I hope you after reading this, you'll join me in my love of curious birds. So this book is shortlisted as a book that has been very well researched. It demonstrates high quality in production, layout and design. She's given careful consideration to how the reader obtains information from the text and the subject matter is engaging and will inspire the young reader to explore further. The vibrant illustrations are beautifully integrated with the written text and the imaginative presentation of the book will fully engage the reader. Well suited to its audience from young children, but even beyond really anyone with a curiosity about nature and its peculiarities. So that's book number one. Number two, Heroes, Rebels and Innovators, Inspiring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander People from History. This is written by Karen Wilde and illustrations by Jaylene BMY. BMIY. 
So Karen is a freelance writer and author of Martu Descent. She lives uh, on the coast south of Adelaide. And Jay Lynn is an illustrator of Manjali and Fijian descent. And she lives and creates on the Gold Coast and has a passion for Pacifica and First Nations culture and communities. And this is quite evident in her work. Hero, Heroes, Rebels and Innovators is the first children's book for Karen and the first time Jay Lynn has used her artistic talent in book illustration. They've come together to research, write and illustrate a book that highlights Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's achievements and resistance during the early years of colonisation. British invasion and settlement, as we know, caused upheaval for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But as Karen states, the heroes, rebels and innovators featured in this book held on to their dreams. This excellently produced, highly engaging book represents or presents Indigenous historical information about significant First Nations people that has been omitted or is less well known in traditional storytelling. Authenticity and authority of voice are established in the opening pages. The author, Karen, has taken great care to be accurate and respectful in her storytelling, ensuring the book is culturally appropriate and honours people's ancestors. Her research was very carefully carried out with the author excluding some stories if authenticity could not be ensured to her satisfaction. So this book covers the stories of seven significant and inspiring Indigenous figures of early colonial days. Pachigarang, a young Darug woman who after meeting Lieutenant William Dawes acted as liaison between local Aboriginal people and the British at Sydney Cove. Bangari, a Darug man who was fascinated with the British col colony and also with boats. He sailed with Matthew Flinders to map the coast of Australia. Taranare from Northern Tasmania was captured by sealers but escaped and became a fearless fighter for the freedom of her people. Yari and Jackie Jackie, who were Wiradjuri men who became the heroes of Gundagai after rescuing nearly 70 people following devastating floods in Gundagai in 1852. Interestingly, I read two adult books recently that had, um, I think it's Anita Heiss's book, featured Yari Yari and Jackie Jackie. And there's another one I read, I can't remember the title, that also featured Taranora adult books that I've read in the recent last few months. Mahara Wakando Lifu, who rescued sailors from Cyclone Mahina that caused uh, chaos in the Torres Strait in 1899. She was the first Indigenous woman awarded the Royal Humane Society's gold medal for bravery. David Unipon was an inventor, human rights advocate and writer. He was the first Aboriginal person to have a book published and featured on our $50 note. And lastly, Fanny Balbuk Uriel, a Wajuk woman who was a resistance fighter who tried to teach white people how to care for the envi environment. So creatively, like some books we've seen in Eve Powell in recent years, two narratives per person are provided. One is a poetic and lyrical story with the language lending itself to the adventure genre, captivating readers, whereas the parallel narrative is biographical, including achievements and resistance. It's a non-stereotypical information book and is imaginative, present, imaginative presented with a striking cover and minimalist, almost naive illustrations enhance the written text with a high gloss, rich and earthy ochre palette, which will interest readers way past the uh, final page. Heroes, Rebels and Innovators is a rich and imaginative text that is short listed due to the richness of language and illustration that adds to the reader's knowledge of previously less known facts and contributions of significant indigenous people from the early days of colonization. It's a beautifully produced book, carefully designed to engage the reader. The parallel stories are enticing and complement each other without overwhelming pure facts, but rather use narrative to convey the information. It is very well researched with careful attention to ensuring information is culturally appropriate and authentic. Number three, Still Alive, Notes from Australia's Immigration Detention System, written and illustrated by Safda Ahmed. Safta is an artist, writer and educator who lives and practices in Sydney. His art practice focuses on issues of representation and belonging, 
referencing personal history and graphic storytelling. Safda is a founding member of the Refugee Art Project for which he conducts art workshops with people of an asylum seeker or refugee background. This organisation was founded to facilitate art workshops for people incarcerated in the Villawood Detention Centre and aims to deepen public understanding about the asylum seeker issues and the realities of Australia's detention regime and to provide a voice and outlet for those detained. So Still Alive came about as a result of SAFTA's many years of visits to Villawood and working with the refugees and asylum seekers there. This is a confronting, raw and graphic account of the history and treatment of asylum seekers and refugees under successive governments in Australia. Challenging, detailed and thoroughly researched, the complex topic of immigration detention has been imaginatively and powerfully produced and will enhance readers' understandings of the issues. It is presented from a very personal and authentic perspective as a result of the author's ongoing connection with those in detention. The personal stories of the detainees' journeys from their homelands and their lived experiences are interspersed with history, news events, government policy, and international human rights reports and reactions. The author's drawings are detailed and the use of the artwork as drawn by the detainees is inspired and powerful. Text and graphics are well integrated and engaging and enhance understanding of issues and impact on those involved. So Safta takes us from his first visit to Villawood and the impact his meeting with those detained there had on him as he heard the stories of dangers faced in their homelands and their terrifying journeys to reach Australia. Haydar's story of flight from Afghanistan after both his brother and father were killed by the Taliban and under threat of himself being killed as his village was continually raided. When he was eight, he saw the corpses of about 50 people who'd been slaughtered. And the perilous boat journeys undertaken to try to reach some form of safety because there was no real choice. In his own words, I'm not naive. We all knew the journey would be dangerous, but it's a choice between that and getting killed in my own country. Before anyone criticizes me, they need to ask what they would do in my position. The history of successive government policies, deceit and hatred engendered over many years is portrayed in detail. Immigration Minister Jerry Hand in 1992 introduced the policy of mandatory detention. We want to clear, see, sorry, send a clear signal. I believe we are being swamped by Asians. They do not assimilate, Pauline Hanson. Illegal, illegal immigrants can be a pipeline for terrorists. Come in and use your country as a staging post for terrorist activities. Peter Reith, Minister for De Defence. Children have been thrown overboard, Philip Ruddock and John Howard. No refugee who arrives by boat will be allowed to settle in Australia, successive governments. As a result of his first visit, Safda was inspired to return with art materials and establish workshops for those interested. He has continued to visit Villawood for over 10 years. His illustrations are harsh and explicit, all in shades of black and white, the only colour being the bold red title and author name on the front cover and spine. The language is direct, on occasion didactic and emotive. The intention of the written text is very clear, to educate the reader as to the realities of incarceration for people seeking refuge in Australia. Illustrations and written text work together, complementing the message that each conveys. The graphic format is very effective in communicating the desired message to the intended audience. Metaphors written and drawn such as monsters, knots and chess pieces are effective in representing the stresses and trauma of the detainees' experiences. Safta does not hold back as he relays individual stories of terror, abuse and fear. Still Alive contains mature content such as self-harm, executions, sexual intimacy and assault, both in written and drawn examples. You're in detention, I can touch whoever I want, from an officer to a mother trying to protect her three-year-old from being forcibly removed from a sandpit. He includes extensive references and links for further reading and actions that be, could be taken to engage the reader in exploring further. 
This is not a conventional entry in EVE panel. It is one of the few entries that fit within the upper end of the age group, being suitable for 15 plus through to adult. The graphic format is inspired and very effective in portraying the intent of the writer. Authenticity is ensured with the inclusion of the personal stories and drawings of the detainees. His background research is extensive and the reader is left in no doubt as to the realities of life for those seeking refuge and asylum. This is a profoundly moving book and not an easy read, but it's not meant to be. As, still, as such, Still Alive is very worthy, uh, worthy of its listing on the short list for 2022. Number four, The First Scientist, Deadly Inventions and Innovations from Australia's First Peoples, written by Corey Tutt and illustrated by Black Douglas. Corey is a proud Camilleroy man who grew up in many places but spent much of his time on the New South Wales South Coast. He's a mentor for Aboriginal people and STEM champion. He's the founder of Deadly Science, an initiative that provides science books and early reading material to remote schools in Australia. He wants to inspire other kids like him to find a passion and love for all things science. He's also edited a number of Deadly Science books for young people. Black Douglas is a Dungati man, originally from Blacktown. He trained in illustration and photography and is self-taught in painting. He previously illustrated Finding Our Heart, a story about the Uluru, Uluru Statement for Young Australians. This well-produced book introduces readers to scientific contributions of ind Indigenous scientists and engineers, both prior to and since European occupation. We know that Australia's first peoples have the longest continuing cultures on earth. And their innovations are amazing from astronomy to engineering, chemistry to forensic science, bush medicine and more. Corey covers many deadly feats covering both ancient and modern innovations. Consulting with communities and elders, Corey along with Black's vibrant illustrations bring the story of science to life. As Corey himself says, today we have many First Nations scientists who are leading the way. Our people have much knowledge and experience to share. This book shares these stories with today's generation of young people to inspire an interest in science and to recognise the contributions of those who've gone before them. Engaging presented, it opens with the AITSIS map of Indigenous Australia, reinforced by topic maps within each section, providing a useful ready reference for the scientific contributions described. Each section focuses on one aspect of science, technology and innovation, astronomers, engineers, scientists, chemists, land managers, and ecologists. From the historical contributions of First, Pape, First Nations people, harvesting by the seasons, boomerangs, and the creation of environmentally friendly glues and resins to bush tracking skills, no GPS needed, and bush medicine, this is a compendium of the contributions of First Nations people far, past and present. The research text is fascinating and draws aspects of science across a broad range of disciplines. The text is detailed without being dense and overwhelming, encouraging further exploration by the keen reader. The language is accessible with sufficient technical language for authenticity, but easily understood and engaging for the target audience. At times, almost conversational, the author invites the younger to think, reflect and challenge themselves to make a difference. Next time you see a $50 note, look at Unipon and be inspired. Maybe you'll come up with your own big invention or idea, referring to writer and inventor David Unipon. Indigenous language is peppered throughout and the inclusion of stories of individual Indigenous scientists provides a contemporary narrative, reinforcing authenticity and relevancy to modern life. Stories such as that, as that of Professor Lisa Jackson Pulver, Koori woman and doctor, inspired to teach First Nations people about health and to help young kids who are unwell. She went on to teach the next generation of young doctors and public health professionals. Leaders such as Paul Sinclair, a young Anawan man with a passion for spiders and a zookeeper at Taronga Park Zoo, who went on to assist young First Nations people find meaningful employment. Vibrant illustrations are appealing and the cre creative layout is imaginative, enhancing the written text without detracting from the essential message within. The color palette is appealing and reflective of the colors of land and environment. 
and there's extensive referencing in this one too. The first scientist is a comprehensive look at the contributions of Indigenous inventors and innovators, concluding with stories of what deadly scientists have achieved, are achieving today. Particularly suitable for mid to upper primary, it's a thorough research, depth of information, and access and appeal to the reader, and beautiful illustrations ensured its listing on the shortlist. So what are you waiting for? Get out there and do some deadly science. Be inspired, be wowed, be amazed, but most importantly, be deadly. I don't time this, but I seem to be going over. Um, the Illustrated Encyclopedia by Peculiar Pairs in Nature, written and illustrated by Sammy Bailey. Sammy is a natural history illustrator based in Tamworth who loves all things weird and wonderful. She has previously been, had um, a CBC honours book with her previous two, two books. From the alphabetized contents page, it uses silhouettes of the animals. And the introduction opening page is clear. This is a high quality reference book of the same standard we've come to accept, expect from Sammy. It is exquisitely illustrated and an informative encyclopedia of the curious pairings and interdependencies in nature and doesn't disappoint. She is explicit in her introduction of exactly what she means by peculiar pairings as she details the interesting relationships between plants, animals, the straightforward and more unusual, providing definitions of mutualism, commensalism, parasitism, mimicry and predation. It contains examples of all these curious behaviours and the ways in which plants and animals have adapted to benefit their lives. The information about each species is thoroughly researched and well organised with each double page, including the scientific names, full page coloured illustration and fact information on the other description, peculiar pairing, conservation status, diet, etc., and fun facts. Clear language with humour in parts. She effectively explains the factual and anecdotal information related to each pairing. It's well organised into small sections to facilitate easy access and the language, while technical, is still easily accept, accessible. The 60 incredible scientific illustrations are designed and organised for maximum visual impact, enhancing engagement and appeal. They are large, colourful and detailed, enhancing the written text and encouraging readers to return, explore further and from things such as the parasitic pairing of the common jack mackerel and the tongue-biting louse with, who gorges itself on the blood of the mackerel through, through to the white suckerfish catching a free ride and food on the underside of the reef manta ray. With peculiar pairs, Sammy Bailey exemplifies why she's on the shortlist once again. This is an attractive, high quality text, well designed to engage an audience from middle primary upwards, but older readers would also enjoy dipping it out. The subject matter is research, well researched and organized and keeps the reader transfix, transfixed. The language is appropriate and there's a high quality of overall production with text and illustrations being integrated to high standard. Lastly, Walking in Gagajou Country, Exploring the Monsoon Forest, written by Anne, Diane Lucas and Ben Tyler and illustrated by Emma Long. Diane moved to Kakadu, originally teaching in Aboriginal outstations and was encouraged and supported by Aboriginal elders to write about the land and get stories to children. Ben Tyler is a Binninge entrepreneur and founder of bush food brand Kakadu Kitchen and Emma Long is an illustrator and educator. It's, this is her first children's book. Combining their expertise in and passion for botanical work, wild landscapes and the culture of the top end bush, they have come together to share this luscious book about one of Australia's most beautiful ecosystems. The genesis of the book stems from a walk taken by Diane and Ben as they walked with a friend in a monsoon forest. They recalled stories and experiences related to trees, animals, birds, insects, hunting and gathering, and stories from elders of past times. Uh, ben lived on his country and they both experience, had experience with elders. It's, this is an engaging and entertaining narrative recount text of a rambling trip through Kakadu. Gagadu, Kakadu National Park is vividly presented and the setting is strongly maintained throughout. 
capturing up mid to upper primary students' imaginations. The exploration is fun, the stopping, observing and listening feel genuine, all enriching the reader experience. The information is detailed and maintains in interest throughout on Indigenous law, plant and animal species and their uses in bush tucker. Avatars representing the authors rambling through the forest with their young friends are cleverly, cleverly used to tell stories and impart information. The text is inclusive of the Kunjamaya language of the Bininj people with English names linked in accompanying labelled illustrations, which are also colour coded and referenced in the glossary, which ensures easy access. The style is conversational, drawing the reader to observe more closely and reflect reflect on the information being imparted. You know, watch out for kabu, the green ants. They're weaving those leaves together so cleverly as they form a nest. The book is beautifully illustrated and detailed to engage the reader to explore further. Long's detailed line and watercolour double page spreads magnificently portray vast landscapes as backdrops to magnified close-ups of many species, such as Cabo, the Green Ants, Ankabo Riverbank, and Nalangak, the frill-necked lizard. The pages spread with movement while highlighted terms in the text add prominence and clarity. I'm nearly finished. Walking in Gagadu Country is a visually enticing book and deserving of the inclusion on the shortlist for 2022. Production is of a high standard with beautiful end papers that entice the reader from beginning to end. The conversation style is effective and engaging and the integration of Indigenous language inclusive, adding authenticity and relevance. The dialogue creating distinctive, authentic characters related to the topic. Illustrations and text are carefully interwoven and the sense of place and the monsoon forest is very strongly maintained throughout. The six books on this year's shortlist are each powerful in their own way. They are unique in terms of content, format, and audience, but each is a high quality production, thoroughly researched, exquisitely presented, and effectively designed to engage the target audience. Each book matches the judging criteria to a high degree, albeit in different ways. For the teachers among you, they would be welcome additions to any class library, with some having specific applications for direct teaching. Enjoy. And I just realized I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. So if you'll bear me with just for a second, I've taught for over 35 years in primary schools in Western Sydney and the Blue Mountains. And um, I've also president of our local sub branch of the CBCA. I was as in my teaching years, I was known as the book teacher because I've always fostered a passion for books. And since retiring, I work for an organization called Westwards part-time. Um, which is a huge literacy development organisation for Greater Western Sydney, and I'm school programs manager, so I take authors and illustrators into schools doing programs for kids. Thanks for bearing with me. I'm sorry I went over time. I thought I'd timed it. Thank you, Danielle. I'm um, sorry, I'm thinking ahead. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, I think that we would just really be glad that we've got this on tape and that we will be able to go back and listen to your very, very thorough and extraordinarily comments about the book so thank you very much um, we've answered a lot of the questions if you could just type into the chat what age you think first scientist is aimed at for terry that would be really terrific and we'll just sure. get danielle to start so yep. that we can um, get on board i'm also aware that there was a question up for michael about the criteria and i'm currently searching for it on the national website and i promise i will post that for the year of the evening. Um, so, Danielle, don't forget to say a few words about yourself. Thank you again, Cheryl. And let's hear for the younger reader judge. Go, Danielle. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is um, Danielle. I'm in, um, I think, quite a unique position that I'm um, a teacher librarian at a P-12 college um, in the Brisbane Logan area. Um, so I don't just get to rave about the books in the younger reader category. I get to... Um, push the books onto everyone in, in um, my school, um, which I'm sure they love. Sometimes they're probably sick of me, um, but that's one thing I love about um, a P-12 school. Um, I know um, we touched on earlier in the night, um, but my category, we had 129 entries um, and we did have to read those. Um, and like the other judges as well, um, thankfully I was on school holidays um, early in December um, because we had 
I think three boxes between the end of November and December. Um, so most of my holidays um, were spent reading, um, but I enjoyed it. Um, the first book um, that we're talking about as well, um, one thing that we find in our category um, with the younger readers is it's they aimed at this um, seven to uh, 13 years roughly. Um, and we, find, we found that a lot of our books, um, what was quite a big range um, and the books that were aimed at the younger um, years were a lot of um, the toilet humour and things like that. Um, we had a few that we found um, treated the, the readers quite well. Um, but yeah, we found big range um, of themes and things in our um, category. Um, the first one I wanted to show you um, though, because it's a beautifully presented uh, book, um, Dragon Skin. Karen Lee Fox is no stranger um, to the Book Week Awards, um, having been on before. Um, hardcover and um, Dragon Skin, if you look into the end papers, um, very much, don't know if you can see it in, um, a little bit there on my screen, very much teacher librarian in me. I love a good end paper um, and it matches um, the Dragon Skin title um, as well. Um, with this one, um, it's set in a small mining town, I believe, um, in Queensland, um, but it could be any small town um, in Australia. And Karen does a really good, do um, really good job of describing um, the setting and putting the reader um, in the small town. Um, we meet Pip. Um, Pip lives with her mum and her mum's new boyfriend, um, and it's quite an abusive relationship, quite um, coercive, um, and Pip really doesn't like. Um, the boyfriend, um, and she spends a lot of time um, out um, in um, outside. And while outside, she finds um, a dragon, um, and the dragon's injured, so she has to look after the dragon. Um, and it's almost um, a, a, another character in the story, um, and Pip has to look after it um, and help it um, get better and survive. Um, and yeah, that parallels um, her life very much. Um, some big themes in here, but um, handled quite sensitively, sensitively for the age group. Um, there's grief. Um, Pip's best friend is no longer um, on the scene. So there's a lot of that as well. Um, I said, touched on the domestic violence, um, friendship, loneliness, um, family as well. Um, and um, half, about halfway through the story, we meet um, some more of her friends discover um, her secret dragon. Um, and letting them into her life is a big thing for her. Um, and they um, begin to help her as well. Um, so quite a beautiful one, that one. Um, I think that's, yep, that's all for that one. Um, the next one um, is the Detective's Guide to Ocean Travel. Um, the uh, Vibes that I got from this, I almost felt like I was back on a ship like the, um, sorry, the Titanic um, in that era of travel. Um, we meet uh, Pepper. Uh, Pepper's dad is actually the captain on the ship, um, but he's quite busy. So um, he doesn't get to spend a lot of time with her. Um, he does let her come on one of her trips, um, but he's obviously quite busy. Um, there's a lot of a lot of class systems in this. Um, Pepper, obviously, being the captain's daughter, um, is in first class and a, around a lot of the wealthy passengers. Um, and a couple of the friends she meets um, are, are not in that category. They're, they're um, third class passengers, um, but that's not a thing for her. Um, and she finds herself in a bit of a mystery. Um, there's been a thief on board. Uh, um, Jewelry has been stolen from one of the passengers. Um, and her and her friends decide that they can solve the mystery. Um, and a lot of red um, herrings that you don't see. Um, and I didn't um, guess who the, um, the, the thief was um, towards the end. So it does keep you guessing. Um, the, the characters are all really well described as well, um, including uh, Pepper and her friends, but also all of the passengers on board. Um, you really find out about their backgrounds and their stories. Um, and then being on the ship. Um, that's all, I think that's all my don't notes. But yes, and it, um, very interesting um, for people these days being put back um, in the times of those really extravagant ships um, and the different ways of traveling with that one. And I'm uh, sorry, Nikki Greenberg is the author of that one. Um, the next one, 
is Huda and Me by um, H. Hayek. And she, the author um, H. Hayek is a, an Australian um, Muslim um, author herself. Um, it begins with Huda. Um, Huda's from a big family and her grandma is sick overseas. Um, and Huda and her um, brothers and sisters are left with a babysitter who's quite questionable. Um, she does things that babysitters probably shouldn't do. Um, so Huda decides to steal um, her passports, um, her pass her and her brother's passports and the credit cards, um, and they join um, her parents overseas. Sorry, I don't know if I, um, I think I skipped that. So yeah, grandma is overseas and she's unwell um, and mum and dad go. So yeah, Huda steals the passports um, and goes over to visit. Um, a lot of humour in this one. Um, it's beautifully written as well that the um, the author explains um, some Muslim cultures and traditions to the reader. Um, one of my um, favourite scenes in this um, that shows you um, the racism and stereotypes from other people is um, Huda's on the plane and she's wearing um, her headscarf and she thinks she looks fabulous and amazing. Um, and she goes to the bathroom on the plane um, and the, the little boy makes fun of her and um, says she looks a bit silly. Um, and it breaks her heart because she thinks she looks fabulous. Um, but yeah, she's quite a funny character. There's a lot of adventure, a lot of humour, um, but definitely shows the, the readers in the category, um, the differences in the cultures and that not everybody um, is nice and treats everybody the same. Um, but quite a lot of humour in that one. The, I think are we down to Glass House of Stars? Yeah. Um, this one is a really interesting one um, that it is written um, in a different perspective. I think, is it second person? Um, so a lot of you. Um, and it's a bit of a challenge for the reader at, in certain parts, but it really puts you um, in Meishing's, um shoes and her perspective and how she's feeling. Um, it's also interesting in the fact that the, um, the house um, is really its own character in the story. Um, and when she's feeling happy, um, you know, the house is a lot lighter and brighter. And then when she's feeling um, down, it's a lot, um, it's big and it's scary. Um, so you get definitely a character in its own mind. Um, Mei Xing comes um, from a different country to Australia. So there's a lot of challenges for her and her family very limited English um, and dad's away working. A um, bit of family tragedy that I won't spoil for you, um, but May, um, May Ching's navigating her own um, way in the world and schooling's very different for her, but she also, ha also has to support her family. Um, and a lot of people are, are misunderstanding, misunderstanding her. Um, and through that perspective as well, you really get a sense of how she's feeling and how other people um, are treating her. Um, so it deals with exclusion, cultural diversity. Um, yeah, and so I was just saying that as well before. Sorry, Mei Ching um, has her own um, difficulties, but she's helping her family. Um, it makes the reader, through that perspective, it makes the reader question how they've interacted with people from other cultures um, and maybe certain things that they, they shouldn't have done. Um, yes, but yeah, it's definitely um, an interesting one with that, that perspective um, and the house being a character with that one as well. Um, the next one, Exit Through the Gift Shop. Um, another, again, another one that's um, really different. Um, if I just show you a few pages in this one, it's broken up with a lot of um, pictures and text in different directions. Um, there's a few definitions and things like that in here. Um, which is definitely suitable for the younger categories. A lot of, a lot of pictures in this one. Um, with this one, I'd just like to read you the first part. So the, um, the character in this story, um, Anna, is actually um, has cancer. 
And the first page starts with, I read this to my grade sixes um, today. So here's the thing, I'm dying, RIP me soonish. And she's got her headstone there. And then that next page says, but don't panic. It's not the end of the world. Well, it, it's kind of the end of my world, but not yours. So chill. I know we're all going to die one day, but according to Dr. Needham, I've got about a year left, give or take a bit. So if that year were to begin today, in fact, right now, this very minute, as I'm writing these words, I'll be dead by 11.43 a.m. on the 14th of October next year. It's kind of spooky to have that sort of time limit put on your life. It's also, it's also sad and scary and surreal. Um, so obviously quite a heavy topic with that, um, but there's a lot of humour in this one. Um, and on top of dealing with a terminal illness, um, Anna actually has to deal with quite a lot of bullying at school, um, but she keeps it private and to herself. Um, so it deals with bullying, friendship, hope and loss. So even though it's a really heavy topic, there is um, hope and loss in it. Um, and um, the end is really interesting too, because it's, it's showing you that um, life isn't perfect and sometimes you don't always get that happy ending um, as well, unfortunately. So um, yeah, very good that one. And um, yeah, really like the fact that it's broken up a little bit. Um, I know a lot of um, the readers at my school sometimes struggle um, with really text heavy um, books, but um, yeah, very good that one. And then the last one is again, someone who's not a stranger um, to the CBCA category. Um, Katrina Nansted, another beautifully produced book, um, hard covered. And again, we like a good end paper. Um, it is very similar to um, We Are Wool, uh, sorry, the uh, We Are, yeah, We Are Wolves um, set in the wall. Um, with my notes, it's um, in the back of it, it tells you that it's based on Sergei Alshakov. And he was the youngest soldier in World War II. Um, and he joined in about six to eight years. Um, he lost his family and he joined the Red Army. Um, so again, really um, big topic for younger readers, um, setting war. Um, but amongst all the horrificness of the fighting, um, there's a real warmth and hope in those circumstances. Um, and one of the highlights for me is the relationship between um, the boy and the soldiers. The soldiers are just so beautiful with him. Um, and he obviously, he's not in combat, um, but he provides food and um, company with them as well. Um, and he gets lost one night and um, comes across a different um, group of army um, and they treat him with the same um, warmth and respect as well. Um, yeah, so all the characters um, are really well written. Um, with Sasha, there's a lot of belonging and identity with that. Um, it's, I found that it, um, I felt like it was really well researched um, by Katrina as well and lots of facts. Um, what I would say with this as well, um, definitely you would have to know um, if you were using it in a school, you'd have to know your students. Um, one of my grade six girls brought it back the other day um, and said she didn't really enjoy it. It was quite a lot for her to take in. Um, so you definitely have to know um, who you were giving this one to. Um, the other interesting thing um, with this one is it is in um, little chapters and every chapter starts with um, some different items. So this one, it says a, a boutique of flowers, a knotted piece of rope, 12 matchboxes filled with ashes and a Yushenka soft and fluffy. I don't know if you can see that one. And it's each, I believe there's four and each of the, um, the motifs are revealed in the chapters and you um, learn to realise what's in them. So this one's the second one um, and it's got a bunch of flowers, a beetle, eight buttons and a fluffy pile of white feathers. Yeah, so that's the books in my category in the younger readers. They all sound amazing and they all um, are probably deserve to be there, although our, we Queenslanders, Danielle, would be disappointed there was no 
um, my brother Ben. I had two teacher librarian <laughs> um, uh, book clubs last week with uh, the Riverbend crowd. I ran them for for Pauline, who's away at the moment. And yes, we were we were not not no. cranky. We just <laughs> sad. <laughs> and with I know it came up in in Michael's chat as well that um, it was really interesting. Of our top six, I think four of them we all agreed on, right? Um, yes. And then the last two we sort of had a bit Very of had difficult. Had a bit chat around, but yes. the, the yes. top four were um, pretty well set in. I can't see any questions for you, Danielle. Um, does anybody want to at this last point? Here we go. Would all the books be of interest to secondary school students? Do you I think? I think so. Yes, a lot mm. of them are definitely um, towards that upper, yep. upper grade. Um, but even things like Huda, I said, there's a lot of that racism and things that they would um, definitely be able to read a lot more into than the younger. younger yes, I people. have that in my secondary library. Um, I think I have all of them in my secondary library. So I think that Year Seven group can be can be um, entertained and and, uh, and um, challenged by these books as well. And that um, with the Glass House of Stars as well, there's a lot of information that you can um, read as well. Those um, upper years would be able to read a little bit more into. Yeah. So I'm just waiting to see if anybody else has something to say. We are right on 7.15. You can see that uh, Jenny has put the Sun Project screen up. But um, this actually... I've realised we all put our um, um, each us to actually. If you are very very keen, there might be if you wanted to get straight in and talk to your branch um, president or it's involved with your branch doing the Sun Project, you might have a last gasp chance. I don't want to give away anything I'm not supposed to, but. Really seriously, you would need to get onto that immediately today if you were interested in that. And I think it's going to be a really great project. I know here in Queensland, we have um, not going to do our Bilby program and we're going to run with this Sun project. So we're looking forward to involving students all around Australia and trying to get them to look at the shortlist in a category using the same criteria as the judges. And um, getting them to come up with their own winners. And I think it's going to be a tremendously exciting project. If we can kick it off the ground and get it moving, it could be something that would be um, really good for all schools and all libraries and all students. We've got another tick for me, Jen, another slide. Danielle, okay. No, no? that's the end of the slide. That's I think the, the end of the other, slide show. The only other thing that we were going to say was uh, about Book Week dinner coming up, if you wanted to mention that. Um, oh, you can do that. Are we talking about? I don't know what to say. I'll say the wrong things. Like I'll give away too much or something. You talk. <laughs> um, okay, so this is just for the Queenslanders online. Um, so the Book Week dinner, well, it's actually not a dinner. It's more like a, a Book Week event because I think it's more like stand-up cocktail food, if I remember rightly. Um, and I can't remember the name of the place. You've been there. The gallery, the the gallery yeah. of, um, oh, I can't remember the name. See, this is no good, Jen. Let's just say gate claimer Friday night. Wait for exciting things that are going to happen. Hopefully, are we allowed to say the venue? Yeah. Yes. Again, I can't you know, remember the the well, name. That's what I said. I can't remember the name. Yeah. It was the Indigenous Indigenous Gallery in Brisbane City. Yes. And, and Spirit yeah. One Spirit. Yeah, Barunga, Barunga Gallery. Barunga, yes. Barunga. Yeah, so Barunga Gallery and we've got Greg Dreis, uh, uh, um, Jackie Farrow and Artie uh, Collard Spratt, yeah, and um, Dave Hartley, uh, I guess speaking, with MC is... Um, I know, Rihanna Patrick. Yeah, that's it. So it's that very exciting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So something a bit different. So thank you, Trish, for being our MC, And thank you to all of our three judges for giving up your time to come along and share 
all of that, um, all your knowledge. And I don't envy you the job at all. I've just been involved in a little microfiction judging where they had to write a story in 120 words. And oh my goodness, that was hard to judge. How do you do it when you're <laughs> judging whole books? Oh, that was sounds terrible to me. So, um, okay, so I'm going to stop the recording here.